Praise the Lord. Welcome everyone here, everyone online, everyone everywhere. We're worshiping together. I welcome everyone in Jesus' name. And I pray the word by his grace, by his spirit, will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for the privilege of coming to worship you and to hear your word. We pray the word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. And Lord, confirm the word, the truth in every heart. Practical word, purposeful word, penetrating word in every heart and life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen before you sit down. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Luke chapter 5 verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. The people pressed on him to hear the word. The people, the audience, the general people, the common people, they were rushing, they were running, they wanted the word, they desired the word, and their interest was on the word. Whatever word he will speak, they didn't know. Whatever topic, they didn't know. Whatever explanation, they didn't know how. It will affect their traditional belief, they didn't know how. It will pinch them pierce them, prick them. They didn't know. All they knew in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came with the Word. He came with the message from heaven. The many things they had known in the Old Testament was going to be revealed again. And they were going to have the heavenly interpretation and application of the word of God. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld this glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And he spoke the word to them. Some of the word he spoke to them, they had heard before. But he brought a new application of the word unto them. And when he finished in one of the series of messages, they said, We never heard this before. He speaks with authority. And not as the scribes and as the Pharisees. And then he concluded by saying, He who hears my word, my saying, and he does it, he'll be like the building, like the house built upon the rock. But he that hears my word, he said, and he doeth it not. Yeah, because they were so used to the old, old things they had heard from uh, those Pharisees and those Sadducees. And they felt, this is new. This is strange. Who can hear this? If they don't do it, they'll be like the people. Yes, they come, they come, they come. They build their houses upon the sand, and the wind will blow, and the stream will come vehemently against their building. It will collapse on the final day, 
on a day when they will not be able to make any repair, any restoration, any refurbishing, and it will collapse and there will be loss for all eternity. And so here we have the people pressing upon him. They didn't say, we had him before, understand this chapter 5. They were preaching and preaching and preaching. They had heard and they had heard some things they never heard before. And yet they came and they pressed on him. They left the old, old traditional world. They left those Pharisees. They left those Sadducees. Hey, they were not rebelling against the world. They were not reacting against the world because the Father, God in heaven, has said, I will send a prophet like unto you, Moses. I'll put my word in his mouth. He will tell the people things that have been hidden from the foundation of the world. And when he tells them, Whoever hears and believes and he does it, that person will be saved. Whoever rejects, I require it of that man, of that woman. And so, those who had the mind or were want the word of God, we didn't come for tradition, we didn't come for street mob utterance you know some people the mob outside that determines what they hear what they preach some people it's the action of the people and what they say they want that determines what the people preach for Christ he came he came from heaven and he came to preach the word of God. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth, the word of God. What did he tell them? He spoke about repentance. That except he repent, he shall not likewise perish. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what he spoke. That's what he said. That's what he taught. And the people had they said, but he says, don't talk about repentance. They don't talk about a renewal of heart, a renewal of life. But that is what he preached. And the people pressed on him to hear that word of God, repentance. He preached restitution. If you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that somebody had ought against you, leave your gift there at the altar, leave the you know, offering there at the altar, and leave the talent there at the altar, go. Reconcile with the person that has ought against you. And when you do that, it says, come back. There is still the chance to offer your gift. He spoke about righteousness. He said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And when the people heard that, they said, this is fresh from heaven. This is new from heaven. I want to hear more of this. And they pressed on him to hear the word of God. He spoke about faith. Believe. Except you believe in me. Ye, your sins cannot be forgiven. He came and he told them the faith that saves us. The faith that changes us, the faith that transforms our life is the faith of God. Have faith in God. Have the faith of God. He spoke about repent, 
believe, turn away from your sin and have faith in the Lord. He spoke about a new life, a change of life, being born again. That when you are born again, it's been born from above. It's been born by the Spirit of God. And he said, except he be born again, born anew, born afresh, born from above. That just coming to worship and just coming to say, we love the Lord, we want to worship the Lord. He said, that's not enough. There must be a time. There must be a day. There must be that moment when you're born again. And Nicodemus said, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, the teacher come from heaven. How can this be? Will an old man go back into the mother's womb and be born? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you, old, a ruler in Israel, a master, in Israel, you must be born again. And he said, that the wind blows. And we do not see the wind, we see the effect of the wind. So, if the man that is born again, a spiritual miracle has taken place in his heart, in his life, and uh, you see the sign, you see the change, the effect of the wind on the trees. And the same thing when you are born again, when you are transformed, when you are giving your life to Christ, there is a change, a transformation that we see the presence of the Spirit of God by the transformation, the change that has come unto you. He preached to them the word of God. And now he preached about marriage. One man, one woman joined together until death do them pass. Master, teacher, but the Pharisees told us that Moses gave them chance that you could write a bill of divorcement and send her away. She doesn't know how to cook like my mother used to cook. She doesn't know how to iron my clothes. She doesn't know this. She doesn't know that. And so they said, if you now don't have any pleasure in her, you can put her away and write a bill of divorcement. And he said, Moses told you that, not that he wanted to tell you that, for the hardness of your heart. That Moses discovered, if he preaches something and tells, he knows it's from God, he sees your reaction, he sees your hardness of heart, he sees your disputations, he sees your drama, and because of that, he felt about enough trouble. And because of the hardness of your heart, he allowed you to give a bill of divorcement. But from the beginning, it was not so. Because God made them male and female. And he joined them together. Of course, I told you, I think it was last night, he does not join a man and a lesbian together. He does not join a woman and a homosexual together. God doesn't do that. He does not join a eunuch with another person that has a complete body and wants to have a real marriage. That's the word. That's the word. Preach the word, be instant in season, and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort them with long suffering, because and doctrine, because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
and they will react whenever they hear sound doctrine. Yet, endure hardness. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. God does not join a eunuch with a lady that is complete, wanting to have a pleasurable, happy, healthy marriage. He preached marriage unto them. He preached sanctification. And he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He told them what the truth was. And he told them what the truth will do. He preached the word unto them. And the people ran to him. They didn't run away. They didn't see, uh, you know, another church on the street that is not going to talk on holiness, not going to talk on sanctification. I <laughs> say, that sanctification, holiness is too much. Let me go and join that. A person like that doesn't have a heart to go to heaven. All they want is religion. All they want is bread and butter. But he preached holiness. He preached sanctification. He preached conditional security. He said false prophets will arise. And they will bring their false doctrine. But he said, because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity abounding everywhere. He said, many will lose their first love and they'll go into their compromised life. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's what he preached. And he didn't, he didn't back down. He didn't go up. He didn't say because they reacted. Okay, what do you want? Doctrines of the Bible are not, de are not decided on the street. Doctrines of the Bible are not decided by the fleshly people, by carnal people. Doctrines of the Bible and the teaching of the Word of God is not decided by weak, prayerless people. Doctrines of the Bible are not decided by graceless people. That Christ, you know, we can't do that. You know, we're used to the old. You know what you are bringing? Somebody has to be prayerful. Somebody has to be full of grace to do that. And we're not ready to be full of grace. We're not ready to be prayerful. Why don't you tone down? Jesus came with the word of God. And when thousands, when he said, this is strange. This is an hard saying. Who can hear this? Many of them went back. But Jesus did not change the word of God he brought. He asked the twelve, will you also go away? Because here is what the Father has given me. And here is what I declare. And Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of of eternal life. And Jesus said, Have I not chosen you twelve? And the reason I should you is to give you all the word of God that my Father has taught me. And I've been giving that to you. And you twelve, I chose you so that you will receive the word and give it out. But one of you is a devil. He was talking about Judas Iscariot. One out of twelve. One out of twelve in percentage. That's a little bit more than nine percent. Nine out of a hundred. That's like ninety out of a thousand. That's like 900 out of 
10,000. That's about more than even 9,000 out of hundreds of thousands. When you work it out by percentage, you 12, you 100, you 10,000, you 100,000, but hundreds and thousands, they are reacting against the world and yet Jesus will not change the world that he brought from heaven why? because our gospel will not save them if he took down the world if he didn't give them the truth it will not save them and he wanted people to, to be saved I came to seek and to save that which was lost and that's the reason he spoke the word and he stood by the word and he's committed it into our hands going to all the world and preach the gospel the good news the word to every creature he that believes and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned and go teaching them all all things that have commanded you and they should learn each observe each and obey each and he said until the end of the world and that's why people came and if you are coming here if you are worshiping here that's why you came and if you're serving here that's why you're serving because it says it came to pass that other people pressed upon him to hear the word of God he stood and he stood firm he stood and he stood erect he stood and he stood looking at the people he wasn't cringing he wasn't fearful he wasn't timid. He, he came from heaven. He's got what he did not have. And so he stood firmly by the lake of Genezareth. And he preached the word unto them. Profitable, personal response to the word of God. When you come here, you hear the word of salvation. And there must be a profitable, personal response to that word of salvation. As you come, you'll hear the word of repentance and restitution. And if you come like the people came, you'll not be judging the word, judging the preacher, judging the preaching, judging the doctrine you'll be judging yourself and as you judge yourself you repent and you make necessary restitution when you come you hear the word of righteousness blessed at they who thirst and hunger after righteousness and they shall be filled you see, when we come to hear the word of God, whether it's repentance, restitution, righteousness, we don't react or respond. We go on our knees, or maybe we're standing up, and we make the necessary consecration, devotedness unto the Lord. That's how we get saved. That's how he fills our heart with righteousness. And when he says holiness is important, he is the only son that came from heaven to show us the way of holiness. If you came as the people came at that time and he pressed upon him to hear the word of God, you will accept, ingest, make it digestible in your heart the word of holiness and you go on your knees and you pray you didn't come here as a, an external examiner to examine evaluate the word of holiness 
should we accept? And you didn't come here to influence other people. Are you accepting that? Are you not accepting that? We came so that this word of holiness and righteousness will be spoken to us in the clearest of time, of times, of ways, and will be and we accept personal response profitable response to the word of God may God give us soft hearts you didn't say amen now and a willing mind another amen so that we carry out the word of God in Jesus name. otherwise we become a nominal church we come, we become a superficial church they go they come as the people go and come but the word they will not do that's a nominal church this church by the grace of God by the power of the Lord the gates of hell will not prevail against the church the gates of hell don't like practical doctrine practical preaching the gates of hell don't like the preaching that will stir up repentance restitution and revival and the gates of hell would like to frighten, silence the preacher of the word of God that takes people to heaven. That's what the gates of hell would like to do. The gates of hell don't appreciate correction. The gates of hell don't appreciate revelation. And so the gates of hell will try to, you know, bury that thing. Stop that, don't say that again. Gates of hell, we're here to confront you. We're here to let you know that Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Not to raise up a nominal church, a superficial church, but to raise up the very bride of Christ that will obey, that will do the word of the bridegroom and the best we can do is to profitably personally respond to that word of God the message is profitable personal response to the word of God three points we're looking at number one we're looking at absolute full surrender to the word of Christ absolute unchanging un, undeniable total surrender to the word of Christ look at that point now just that point number one we're looking at absolute full surrender to the word of Christ. Look at the three things there. We're looking at Peter under a surrendering the sheep and the substance to Christ. Profitable surrender of sin and self to Christ and perpetual surrender in sacrifice and service to Christ. You know the story already. We've been reading this a long time. What we need is to understand. Understand the story. Look at Peter's surrender of sheep and substance to Christ. In Luke chapter 5 verse 2. Luke chapter 5 verse 2. And he saw two sheep standing by the lake and the fishermen were gone out of them and they were washing 
their needs. And then in verse 3, in verse 3 we are told, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, belonging to Simon, and prayed him and asked him that he was thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the sheep. You see, they had caught nothing that night. But that poverty, that penury, that nothingness did not hinder the fact that when Jesus asked him for the sheep, for the substance, for what he had, he didn't say, well, no money, no food, no fish, no profit. There's not the time to serve the Lord. No. The people who want heaven more than earth, the people who want God more than self, they don't consider all that. They surrender fully what they have. That's how Peter got saved. You know, the miracle that followed. That is how Peter got saved. That's how we get saved. You come, you must surrender something. Even things that were profitable for you. If you are dealing with a profitable job, you are selling what you should not be selling. Maybe cigarette, maybe alcohol, maybe your body, whatever you are selling to make a living. Now, Christ wants to come into your life. You must surrender all those things that brought gain, that brought money. I'm going to ask you, you say you are born again. You say you belong to Christ. At the point of salvation, what have you surrendered? Have you left anything? Have you abandoned anything? Even things that were gain and profitable to you, if Christ demanded that you submit this, you surrender this, have you done that? That's the question. It's not just a matter of, I know the Bible, I study the Bible. Yes, I understand. What have you surrendered? I know what I surrendered. I know what I gave up. In the church I was born again. That wasn't my original church. I had another church I was going in. And I was doing something for them there, I told you before. And when the call of repentance and salvation came, where I was known, where I was appreciated, I surrendered that thing. Have you surrendered anything? Look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at profitable surrender of sin and self to Christ. At the point of salvation, you have to have definite things you forsake at the point of sanctification. You go back to the Lord, there must be something that you surrender. Something that you surrender. I can't understand how somebody can come to the Lord. There must be something God has observed that although you are saved, now for you to be sanctified, this has to go. That's sanctification. We call it consecration. In the heart, in the mind, in the things we possessed, in our nature, in our depraved mind, the things that will not allow us to match with the life of Christ. Saved. All the external sins are gone. But self is still dominating. And self is coming in, in competition 
with the Savior of the soul and the sanctifier of the spirit. And we have to come again and have this surrender of self. Have you surrendered anything beyond the point you are saying? Think about it. Think about it. He wants us to come to thoughtful reflection. Have you surrendered anything in self? I mean, it your own way. Self? I mean, each on your own terms. Self? Wanting to beat down anyone that will not agree, align with your self centeredness. Have you surrendered that at salvation? We surrender, we give up, we forsake sin and all the things that used to bring profit to us will forsake everything. At sanctification, yes, we come again and we say, Lord, I thought I'd surrendered everything. But I see that actually self rules everything in the church, at home. With the husband, with the wife, with the people we are working with in our various homes where we earn our living, self, self-centeredness, to be like a manager, master, master controlling everything and everyone. At sanctification, we come, we surrender everything concerning self. Number three here. Number three, we're looking at perpetual surrender in sacrifice and service unto Christ. Personal, perpetual, perfect surrender. Throw your net there. And he threw the net there after saying, we toiled all the night and we caught nothing but at thy word. That's the Christian life. I have my own feeling at thy word. I have my own story I could tell all the night but at thy word. Word. Let to me alone. I would not like to do that because I've tried that and it doesn't work. But at thy word. When you come to the point you want to be serving the Lord, you want to be totally yielded and giving to the Lord. What matters now is not how I feel, how I think. What's comfortable, what's convenient, what I'm used to, what I'm not used to. No, no. By my training, no. At thy word. That is Christian life. That is Christian service. Anything apart from that, anything beyond that, it's not acceptable to the Lord. You must come and surrender. Not my will, but thine be done. Not my way, but thine be done. Now they caught a lot of fish. A lot. And this was the greatest number of fish they ever got in their fishing career. And then Jesus said, follow me. And he pursued that. He pursued that. He didn't continue. Lord, let me first sell this. Let me first, after all, you gave the blessing to me. Let me first go and do this. And then I will come and follow you. No. They let all. And he followed him. What have you left? 
without grumbling. What have we led? Without carnal comparison with other people, I left so much, and all these other people, they are not leading anything, and they are all still involved. Ah, that's carnal comparison. What have you led? Have you left your own ways? Have you left your own profit? Have you led your own mind? Let me say my mind. Let me show them my mind. No. We have to live. We have to live. We have to live. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 33. In Luke chapter 14, verse 33, Jesus said, Whosoever be of you, so likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he has. All his opinion, all his idea, all his own way, all his own, do it my own way. Whosoever, any of you that does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Surrender at the point of salvation. Surrender at the point of sanctification. Surrender at the point of service to so bring your service to the Lord and you want others to, to surrender like that you don't want to be an example a model a pattern of reaction to the word of God that even the people that want to concern the word of God and submit to the word of God they have you there he's been there a long time she's been there a long time and if she is reacting and if he is reacting uh, I think I like to join them and you know form a conspiracy and then we we'll react. No, we we'll respond to the word of God. We're coming to point number two. Point number two astonishing faith surprises in the work of Christ. Astonishing faith surprises to the word of God. To the work of Christ was surprised. Surprised that Christ came and he gave this commandment. And as the people did exactly as he said, they were provided for, they were cleansed, they were healed, healed in the body, healed in their skin, healed. In their hearts, they were healed. Astonishing faith surprises in the work of God. Salvation is the work of Christ. And a surprise as we believe the Lord for salvation. What I used to be, I am no more. A leper by birth, a leper by life, a leper by lifestyle, but you came to Christ and faith gave you a surprise that that leprosy, that sinfulness, that incurable, depraved, dirty nature, Christ clears everything away and cleanses everything at a word. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, is a new creature, not even a spot, a stain of the old leprosy of sin remains. He clears everything. Tell me about your salvation. <clears throat> Tell me about your cleansing. He cleanseth us from all sin, like he cleansed that leper from all leprosy. And the cleansing was visible. The leprosy that was there before, no more there. Is the cleansing visible, knowable in your own life that all the stains and all the spots of that Adamic nature, of that Adamic defilement, of that depravity, all the stain, all the sport. Can you show us? They used to be there. 
They're no more there now. That is the astonishing faith surprise that is in the work of Christ. That when he cleanses us from the old defilement of spiritual leprosy, everything vanishes away. Not even a stain, not even a spot. Everything vanishes away. And the leper could tell. And the onlookers could tell. And everybody around could tell. What we make of the work of Christ today. He saved me. Okay. But I still see the spots and the stains and the sinfulness of everything we used to see. And I still see the rebellion, the attack, and I still see the smelling character that used to be there when Christ walks and he cleanses leprosy, that leprosy in your body, that leprosy in your soul, that leprosy in your system, that self-centeredness that defiling spot everything he cleanses away if you have not seen that cleansing go back to Christ go back to Calvary because that sin of leprosy will not go to live where the sanctified the pure the holy where you dwell. It has to be cleansed. It has to be taken away as that man was cleansed in Luke chapter 5 verse 12. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city behold a man full of leprosy. A man full of leprosy. Check up. In the Old Testament, no Israelite full of leprosy was cleansed. Except Naaman that came from Syria. That from a foreign country. But all those hundreds of years, thousands of years, in the Old Testament, no Israelite apart from Miriam had been cleansed from leprosy and here now comes a leper. Maybe you've never seen anybody cleansed of the Adamic nature. Maybe you've never seen anybody so washed whiter than snow. Maybe you've never seen anybody that was totally sanctified and made holy and the spot and the stain of depravity was totally cleansed away. You can be the first person known to yourself. You can come to Christ and surrender that thought and that idea. Can any be cleansed from leprosy? Surrender that idea. Surrender that notion. Surrender that statement of impossibility and come to the Lord. And the Lord will cleanse you. You know, he can so wash us that even we ourselves, it's a surprise. A miracle of surprise. And the people living around you, who knew your life, even the ones you are trying to sweep under the carpet. But you know, people who are living, they still know those things you are trying to sweep under the carpet. But when you present yourself to Christ, he has saved you. And you say, what I want now is sanctification, purification. And the Lord sanctifies you, purifies you, and purges you. The neighbors around you who know the way you normally, in a subtle way, subtle, subtle way, in a subtle way that you normally react, you normally do this, and you normally want to enthrone self on the throne of your heart. They see that now enthroning self, all that is gone. 
living for him and living for him alone, all that is gone. And all those practices that he used to do in reaction to correction, in reaction to rebuke, in action to in reaction to pointing out anything, all those reactions, they are gone. It softens your heart. It purifies your heart. You have the blessedness of the people. They said, uh, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We're coming to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at affectionate, fuller submission to the will of God. Affectionate, fuller submission to the will of God. When we talk of submission, there are different kinds of submission. Okay, I submit. I hear and so I bend externally. But the man on the inside is still standing. And when this period is over, that the direct thing is not there again, the man standing on the inside in rebellion will still come out full force and still stand against the will of Christ. No. But a submission that is full, that is fuller than anything we had before. And we totally submit unto the Lord and we influence all the people around us like Levi did after following the Lord and brought in all those publicans and sinners and said, I met Christ. He changed my life. And you know, I used to grab covetously and I used to grab tenaciously. And nobody could take any of those things from me. But now I met Christ. Christ. I was at the receipt of custom and the people were lining up and they were giving, you know, the act to because I have license from the Roman government. And then Jesus appeared. He didn't line up with them to pay obeisance to Matthew, to Levi. He came with authority. The authority of a savior, the authority of a sanctifier, the authority of the sovereign, the master, the king, the lord. And he told me, follow me. And I left all and I followed him. I didn't do it grudgingly. I left all and I followed him. I didn't do it half-heartedly. I left all and I followed him. I didn't do it as if it was compulsion. And, uh, you know, I didn't do it as if temporarily. All right, today I follow you. Tomorrow I decide what I will do. I left all and I followed him. And then all his contacts all the other publicans and sinners, he knew them, they knew one another. He went calling them, calling them, calling them. He didn't have the knowledge to preach to them, the power to preach to them himself. But he knew that the same Christ who changed my life, who changed my direction, who took covetousness away from me, and he gave me a heart to follow him, money or no money. That same Christ can change them, and he got them together that they were listening to that same Christ. After he knew the Lord, he didn't uh, feel 
Christ is in demand will be too much for these people. I don't want them to hear the same thing I heard that pinched me, that pricked me, that so penetrating my heart, so penetrated my heart, I couldn't resist. That would be too much for them. There are some people who say they are saved, they are lenient on other sinners. I don't want to bring them to the church I go. I don't want them to hear the word firm, deep, searching, that would compel them. They may not want to come again. And so, but I will still direct them. I know that other church, they are, well, they talk about Christ. They talk about being born again, but they are not, they are not firm and deep in the word. I'd rather send them there. No, Matthew did not do that. He called them together and he came to and then invited Christ to his home and they heard the same word of repentance and when the Pharisees said he eats of sinners and publicans that's what they saw they didn't see the preaching you know insincere people they don't see the real thing that is being done he didn't go there just to eat. He was invited by Levi, Matthew, come pray to my people. And of course, in the process, he gave them food and they ate. And Christ, of course, also ate. But the only thing, though some believers, Pharisees could see, he eats way. Pharisee, he came to this earth to seek and to save sinners. And that's what you want to do there. The major thing there, the important thing there, the central thing there is that he preached unto those publicans and sinners, not just eating. And so he preached to them. And when those Pharisees complained, this Jesus said, that those who are not sick, that you say you are not sick, they don't need a physician. And those who are self-righteous, although their self-righteousness will not take them to heaven. I didn't come to invite and to bring those who are self-righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance yes the publicans and sinners before him they were sinners but you know what he came to do that's exactly the ministry he came to do he came to call sinners to repentance and that's why we're here too he gave us the same ministry and he's giving us the word of repentance and he says repentance must be preached in all the nations of the world and he said you wait for power from on high for ye have heard of me that as John baptized in water so will you be baptized in the Holy Ghost and then you'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth and that's why we're here that's why you're here that you ought to repent of your sin because sin will drag your soul into a lost tormenting eternity and when you repent and anything that you need to restore is restitution anything you need to restore in sincerity and honesty with conviction that you really believe that that is the word of Christ you do that and now your hands are clean your life is clean 
and the spirit bears witness with your heart that you are born again that you are saved and for those who have been saved he wants us to come back you know self you know now the life of self-centeredness that is within and is expanding and that self-centeredness is growing and growing until it is growing to your neck and I think can suffocate you and take away from your hand even the things that you used to have. You come back to the Lord and you surrender. And that suffocating self-centeredness, you bring out, you vomit it out, you lay it on the altar. And he sanctifies you. And now... You also want to serve the Lord in any capacity. Even those who are Levites and all they do is that they clean the floor. Is that they take the utensils of the temple, they patch the patchy. Ye that bear the vessels of the Lord, that you come before the Lord, I want to serve the Lord and only the people that are clean in their hands and pure in their hearts will serve him. You also surrender and you lay it on the altar. Say, Lord, here I am. And the Lord will do that in your life in Jesus' name. And your life thereafter, the way you live, will not be determined by the street, the street mob. They seem to have heard the word of God, but they don't want to accept. And so they stand on the street wanting to let you know that they don't accept. If they're not supporting Christ, if they're not supporting the, the doctrine of Christ, just overlook them. They're not important to your life they're not important to your ministry anyone that then will stand anywhere in church outside the church on the street corner anywhere that will try to prove to you that the word is not important enough for you to follow if you're going to get to heaven you abandon them and then the following service, like the people did, you press, press in the kingdom of God from the time of John the Baptist until now. So that violence. And the people, they press into the kingdom. You do it like Paul, I press towards the mark of the high calling. And then you overlook anyone that will hinder that you decrease your surrendering to the Lord. And like God, like the Lord used Peter, he will use you. Like the Lord used Paul, the apostle, he will use you. The things that were gained unto me, those I abandoned, I even treat them like dung like drugs, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, whatever I need to surrender, that I surrender. He had a letter from the authorities in Jerusalem as he went to Damascus. That letter was resigned when the sun shone from heaven and it fell to the ground. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? And the answer came, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. What will you have me to do, Lord? The letter was still in the sun. 
go to Damascus, it will be showing you what you will do. And he went to Damascus. He didn't go, he surrendered that letter. I can't use this letter again. I can't hold on to this authority again. And was prayed. And God told Ananias, there's a man called Saul. This is the street where you will find him. Go lay hands on him that he receive the Holy Ghost. And then God said, three days, three days, and three nights, behold, he prays. He prayed on his heart out. He surrendered that letter of authority to persecute the believers. He never used that letter of authority.